Good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm Ganesh Raghunathan. I work with Nature Conservation Foundation in the southern part of India in this uh, state called Tamil Nadu. So the landscape I work in is a human-dominated landscape, which is primarily a tea and coffee uh, plantation area. Um, so this is where it is. So the place that I work is called Valparai. And it's a part of the larger landscape, which is the Anamalai, we call it. Anamalai itself translates to elephant hills. So Valparai was set up around 1890, where four large tracts of forest were cleared to make space for plantations. So now we have Valparai, which is about 220 square kilometers. And this is home to about 80,000 people whose lives and livelihood is completely dependent on these plantations. We also have about 100 to 120 elephants that use this landscape regularly. And um, my work primarily focuses on understanding how elephants use this place, as well as finding ways to mitigate issues that may pop up from time to time. Um, this is pretty much uh, what you see in my landscape. So we'll see herds of elephants using these tea estates. And if you look to the right hand side, you can see some houses. And right behind them, there are some eucalyptus plantations as well, which elephants use as refuge during the day. And on the far left, if you see, those are the protected areas that surround our landscape. So there's absolutely no way where we can separate people and elephants from using this place because both of them are dependent on their resources and the space. And that is where situations get tense on some occasions. So some of the major issues that we have in this landscape is damage to property and another serious concern is loss to human lives. When it comes to damage to property, it is primarily elephants that damage uh, the kitchen sides of houses, ration shops, or the places where we store food grains. And the noon meal centers are places which are adjacent to schools where the government provides uh, food to students who study there. So uh, to begin with, uh, we started this study on elephants to monitor elephants in this landscape back in 2002. And uh, our primary concern was to understand how elephants are using this place. The first invitation to start this entire work began from the, came in from the plantation management itself. And they said, you know, we, believe, we think there are about 2,000 elephants that are here, and uh, most of us believe elephants are looking to kill people. So it took us about three to four years to actually understand what is actually going on there. And then we recognized that we have about six herds of elephants which are very active on the landscape. That is, they spend about seven to eight months on the landscape. But we do have many other herds which are uh, found along the periphery of the uh, plantation and the protected areas that surrounds this place. Having understood that, we also looked at uh, the different kinds of property damages that we have. And over the years, when we looked at it, uh, it's mostly the residential colonies that get hit and followed by the uh, ration shops, which are the next most sought out uh, places. So in the ration shops, it's mostly rice that is stored and uh, lentils and few other sugar and sugar cane and things like that. Whereas in the residential areas, it's mostly the, in fact, we've noticed that elephants break the walls. So we have large stony structures and we do not use cement there. It's mostly mud walls, but plastered. We've noticed elephants even eating the mud, not even eating things from the kitchen, but just eating that part of it. And uh, our place has native vegetation of jackfruit. So that's growing all over the place. So people love to take some jackfruits home, and they tend to keep these jackfruits in the kitchen side. And again, that seems to be something that the elephants really are fond of. So we also looked at what are the reasons uh, where, uh, sorry, we also looked at the human death uh, occurrences that occurred there. And between 94 and 2002, we've had about 48 people who've lost lives to elephants. And uh, it's mostly uh, about 34 men and 14 women have lost their lives. And the age groups, if you look at it, it's varied from 13-year-old children to about a person who's been 67 years old as well. Um, we also looked at how did these in, uh, incidents occur. So about 29 of the 48 incidents that happened here were primarily the roads. And when I say roads, these are not tar roads or well-established roads that you have trucks plying on, but these are estate roads which are very narrow. And um, if we look back into um, archival rep records of how these roads came into existence, these are mostly animal tracks which were widened to uh, facilitate ease of business there. And elephants continue to use this, uh, these roads even today. And most of the times, what happens is the bus stops are at a place, and then people have to walk from these bus stops for about half a kilometer or a kilometer into the estates to reach their homes. And this is when these, most of these interactions occur where between people and elephants. <coughs> and also, if you look at the time, when do these instances occur? It's mostly between the months of December and February, where elephant activity is really high in our areas. So we have elephants that are present in this landscape throughout the year, but uh, from the month of August, end of August onwards, towards the end of monsoon, we start to notice that elephants start to slowly, gradually increase their numbers as they uh, enter the plantations. So between October to February, 
um, we see the most number of elephants on the plateau. And uh, there is really no pattern to what time of the day this occurs because early mornings these instances have occurred. We have a practice where um, the estate workers take a quick one hour break for their lunch, but they have a quick meal and they run off to the nearest forest fragment to collect firewood. And in this hurry to, because they have to get back to work on time, they tend to ignore uh, if there's any sounds or any other wildlife that is present there. And in this instance also, there have been uh, accidental encounters with people, sorry, with elephants. <coughs> so we also, uh, now currently the state in Valpara is that most of the people who work are in the age category between 40 and 60. And if you look at the attire that they wear, it's mostly uh, plastic sheets that are wrapped around them. And it makes it really difficult for them to run away if at all they end up encountering an elephant at some point or the other. Most of the youngsters seem to uh, not really be interested in working in the plantations anymore. They're choosing to go to towns or cities and look for other opportunities for employment. So this is something that uh, we noticed here. Uh, also, we looked at what are the situations under which these encounters happened. How did people lose their lives? And we found that most of the deaths that occurred here were accidental in nature. People did not know where elephants are. Along with that, there were many instances where there was lack of safety at work, but that is something that we've started to address in the past decade or so now. So we have people who watch out for um, when people are working in a certain estate, there are watchers who are specifically uh, put in place to just keep an eye out for elephants or any other animal that may uh, come, come across in that area. Um, there have been many instances where chasing of elephants have happened in a very unplanned way and this has resulted in somebody else who had absolutely no clue that there was a drive operation going on. They also ended up uh, encountering elephants and losing their lives. Alcohol is still an issue in our areas, so we do have people who have been uh, inter inebriated and they've encountered elephants. But there have also been people who have said, I have lived here for 30 years, I have lived here for 40 years, I know how to deal with elephants. If I say a certain name or chant the name of a god or something like that, elephants will make space. But that's not true always, and some instances have made things really difficult in that way as well. Um, so having understood these aspects about how things are happening, how people are using this landscape and how elephants are using this landscape as well, we thought we should come and find ways in which we should implement certain methods which will actually help people as a facility that they can grab onto to ensure their own safety. Uh, we also realized it is very important in this landscape for all of us to be connected because as these are tea estates, it's really far off and spread. So colonies are quite detached from one another. And we have, very, uh, we have fragments of forest, about 40 fragments of forest in this uh, 200 square kilometers, which elephants actively use. So now we started to build a network of all the stakeholders who uh, happen to be the estate management, people who live in the estate, the estate workers, the politicians, the media, the forest department, conservation organizations like us, police department, the fire department, so many other people. So having brought all of them together, we decided, okay, how about we start um, communicating this information about where elephants are to the local people so that they can take some precautions. So to do that, uh, way back in 2006, we started, as we had already started monitoring elephants in that area, we started to produce this information wherever elephants are on a local cable channel, which has a, pop a subscriber population of about 5,000 people. And that is how we began uh, this entire process with a phone number that people could reach out to. Around 2011, uh, our mobile network connectivity definitely improved in, that, in, the, in our area. And hence, we started to send out bulk messages to people residing in certain areas where elephants are present. So this is being sent in both English and in the regional language. And so that with a phone number that they could reach out to. So now we approximately send about 2,500 messages every day. Um, around 2015, we realized that many people said, some of them said, we cannot read, we, we don't know how to read, or our phones are very basic, so they cannot support the regional text, the characters in it. So we decided to send out voice calls so that all they need to do is just answer the call and get the information that they need. So that is something that is currently going on as well. Um, looking at the response of people to all these uh, facilities that we provided, um, way back in 2011, it was the number of calls that we received was very high at that point of time. Where, But the nature of the call was mostly people called to ask, where are the elephants? Is it safe for me to go to this place? So that was something really nice that they were actually now starting to use this facility to plan their own uh, evenings activities. But from the following year, we started to notice a little shift in it. Now people started to call and say, hey, I have seen elephants here. Please 
send out a message in this pattern. Or I've noticed that elephants are starting to move towards another direction, so please inform people on the other side as well. So now we started to notice a lot more engagement that was happening with the local community. Um, and sorry. And all, as these calls are also, uh, as you see the peaks, it's also coinciding with the months where elephant activity is actually higher in our uh, areas. Um, but way back again, in 2011, along with the SMS project when we started it, we also uh, installed certain alert light indicators. So these are red flashing lights which can be operated with a mobile phone. And these are basically, uh, we wanted the community be, to be a part of this. So we got the community to choose representatives from themselves, among their groups, to actually be the people who are operating these lights. So since 2011 till now, we have about 90% of the operations are being carried out by the community members itself. And that is something that they take pride in because now they feel that extra recognition from their local community saying, okay, look, I'm looking out for you with the elephants because these are some of the most proactive people in those areas. So having done these things, of course, uh, continuously, every year, we just before the elephant season begins, we meet as many estate workers as possible. We tell them, hey, keep an eye out, there's a season now. Because we have about three months during the peak monsoon where we do not have much elephant movement. But just before the elephant season starts, we go and have lots of interaction meetings with the workers to say, if you see elephants, this is what you need to do. This is the number you need to contact if you need any help. This is the forest department number and various other things. Uh, of course, standing there and talking to people regularly, and they keep getting bored of seeing me also, I guess. So we started to in, uh, in bring in artists from different places, perform some street plays, and communicate the same through song and dance as well, which is getting some really nice uh, responses there. Uh, once a year or twice a year, we try and bring in all the stakeholders for a meeting where we discuss how the previous year has been and what are the things that we failed in the previous year and what are the things that we need to probably do to address the issues every year. And that has been quite welcoming from all the stakeholders as well. Uh, but one very big change that happened to this project and uh, to the uh, to Valpara itself was the forest department stepping it up in 2012 when they started to invest a lot more vehicles and more manpower in dealing with this. But more importantly, they spent a lot of time and effort in training the uh, staff who are uh, in the, with the forest department. The local boys were recruited for this. And I'm very happy to say we've completely stopped using firecrackers in our region for close to eight or nine years now. And um, we're noticing that elephants also have been avoiding houses just with the sound of just making our presence known. It could be with a vehicle or it could just be clapping or it could just be hooting and things like that. And very specifically, so they've been trained in a very specific way so that they do not keep putting a lot of pressure on the elephants to constantly keep driving them, which used to be a practice earlier. And that I see as a positive thing where things are looking good in that sense. Um, looking at the trend of uh, or the impact of the early warning system between 1994 to 2002, until we began our studies, the average number of people losing their lives to elephants were three people a year. But since actively we began to monitor elephant movements in this region, um, it's almost 20 years now since we've been monitoring them there, we started to notice a gradual decline in uh, loss of human lives and happy that it's been about more than one and a half years since we've had the last instant. Hopefully it stays this way for a longer time. Um, so, if the earlier trend had continued, we would have probably had another 32 more people who may have lost their lives. Um, some of the lessons that we learned here were that uh, earlier the belief was elephants are always looking to kill people, but we started to recognize which are the most cons uh, sensitive hotspots in this area so that we could put in some targeted efforts to deal with that. So the whole shift of looking at elephants as villains or rogues and all the other wordings that they use in the media has slowly started to change. And uh, we are targeting more on the locations which seem to have some of the issues here. Um, we also understood what are the challenges that the people, local people face. And we our solutions were primarily based keeping the local people in mind. And that's how we tried to address most of these issues. And one of the most common issues that we have there, along with elephants, is issues with leopards and bears. And most of the time when something goes wrong, it's mostly a reactive measure that we always indulge in. And so being prepared in terms of dealing with the leopards or with the elephant scenarios, uh, we've been encouraging the local government as well to be more proactive about it. And we've been getting some really nice support in that aspect as well. So we do understand there are no permanent solutions to it. And elephants also are constantly adapting and changing the, and their strategies. And I guess we also need to keep doing the same. So with this, I'll end my talk. Um, thanks to all our supporters. They've been fantastic help for us in going all the way so far. Thank you.
We've got time for one quick question. Yes. My name is Moon Mai. I come from Karnataka in India. I work for Fauna and Flora International. So I'm quite familiar with the, the, the landscape and also the challenges there. So the question I have is mostly about the crop loss. So people also kind of start driving the elephants away uh, to save the crop. And that also leads to more damages, especially when there's a huge herd and a huge crowd, which we quite see in most of the Indian landscapes. It's, uh, it's mostly driven from the fear of crop loss and crop uh, livelihood loss, leading to uh, damages with the property as well as the life loss. So, I mean, this project, I'm aware that it's created a lot of awareness with the people to, and also have saved lives. But in terms of driving elephants away in a safe way, um, and also crop laws, uh, have you taken any steps that others can also learn from and adopt? Um, so we do work in another landscape called Hassan. Uh, so there we do have issues with crop loss. And yes, it is a very challenging issue, and especially if a farmer has borrowed a lot of money at high rates of interest and all their crops are really destroyed in a single night, that is really difficult for the entire family and the village as well. But there's, it's really difficult because once the elephants are in that space, in a cropland area, it could be one farmer, or it could be five different farmers who are sharing boundaries, it becomes really difficult. And then there's a lot of pressure from the local community as well on the forest department. But there's other issues of like compensation, other things. But here, because it's something related to elephants, the whole onus falls on the forest department. But because there's also agriculture and things, I think we could do a lot more better. Uh, we could have a lot more good results if we can somehow get the agriculture department, forest department to actually get together and have a set of compensation where people can actually be, you know, that issue, the immediate economic situation can be addressed. But again, driving elephants, barriers, there are so many, like how we've been looking at so many things, we will have to explore these options and see how it works because each place is different, each habitat is different every 200 kilometers away, there's so many new different challenges. So I think if we can address the economic situation a little better in that sense, where we get together with two or three different organizations of the government itself and figure something out, I think that will definitely ease the pressure on the farmers as well. Thank you. Uh